I'm William Andreessen, host of Speaking with Students, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows in the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hello and welcome to Black, Brown, and Bilingue, where our mission is to unite the black and brown communities through education, storytelling, and community engagement. The vision of Black, Brown, and Bilingue is to be part of creating a world in which Black and Brown identities are affirmed, bilingualism and biculturalism are nurtured, and equity is the driving force behind all that we do. Thank you for joining us again today. I am Lisette Jacobson, and I am one of your hosts. And I'm Maurice McDavid. I'm your other host. All right. Welcome to another episode of Black, Brown, and Bilingue. I am so excited for today's guests. I have queer, working class, Mexican fantasy author who's writing and living and moving between cycles of surviving and thriving. Also author of my new favorite book, The Lost Dreamer, Liz Huerta. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. It's like um, I picked up your book. Let me tell you a little bit. So I was at the store at Barnes and Noble. And usually I go there to do some writing sometimes because it just kind of inspires me to be around books. And I saw this cover and I'm like, damn. And I I buy too many books. Like I have a problem. I have too many books that I don't even like get through. But I'm like, damn it. I need to go get this book. I need to look at it. And as soon as I picked it up, I was like, hell yeah. And then when I read the back, it was like, I'm sold. So I am obsessed. Thank you. I mean, I think the cover, um, Samuel Rodriguez, the cover artist, I think he's a huge reason I sell so many books just because people want this gorgeous art on their shelves. And then hopefully they read the book too. Uh, And it's so beautifully written. Like, I am immersed. So I'll tell you, I've always loved to read, but I didn't gravitate towards fantasy much growing up and I think it's because I didn't see I I couldn't identify with it but somehow with your book I mean I've liked other fantasy things now that I'm older but with your book I as I read about the temple and the way that you describe things I'm like hell yeah I'm in like Mexico somewhere that's what I picture at least yeah pretty much (laughs) right I picture it but I did want to ask like I noticed that there's not Spanish in here, yeah. at least that I've read. Was that intentional? Absolutely, because I wanted to write a book that um, was without any colonization. And Spanish is a colonial language. And even though I'm writing in English, I still wanted to situate the world um, in a world where there is no colonization, where the society, this culture is still very, I mean, you know, there, there's factions within the land, but there's actually not like, the big intruder coming in and um, and changing the world, right? And I'm sure there are aspects of my own, you know, colonization that made it into the book that it's, it's a lifelong process to kind of remove those things. But um, I was like, yeah. And I remember somebody asked me once, they're like, uh, why aren't there any white people in your book? And I'm like, why would I put colonizers in my fantasy? This is my fantasy. Like, why, why would I? <laughs> like, oh, you're sorry. You wanted me to bring in some disease and destruction? No, thank you. Oh, snaps. Yes. I love it. Um, I think it's just so beautifully written. While the artwork is gorgeous, I have to tell you, though, the writing is just equally as beautiful. Um, and so I think it's uh, really cool that you did that without any touch of colonization. <laughs> I definitely picked up on it right away. I was because the names even and the words that you use to describe it's just um, untouched by white people. Um, but I do kind of want to take a couple of steps back because I was doing some research on you and I ran across one of your writings. Um, Lipstick saved me from the apocalypse. Yes, girl. I have to like read an excerpt. Okay. Okay. 
Um, my red lips invited people to treat me as though I were bold. I reacted as if I were bold. I wanted to be wild, a dancing queen, raunchy and flirtatious in the legacy of red-lipped women throughout history. I became wild, raunchy, flirtatious. It was exhilarating, but ultimately exhausting. I love a red lip girl, but can you tell us about this piece? <laughs> oh, I was invited to write for the cut from New York Magazine. And they wanted to write, they're like, can you write something about lipstick? And I was like, ooh, lipstick. And then I went back to one of my first interactions with lipstick was as a teenager. Um, in the article I write, I, we were Jehovah's Witnesses growing up. So it was a very kind of isolated, insulated world. Yeah, you know, and just like very close minded and very judgmental. Yes. And one of my theas worked at Mac or no, worked at Nordstrom at the makeup counter. And I used to go in there and I'd see these women wearing this gorgeous red lip. And I was like, I'm going to find the color. And the color I found, um, I turned into a little goth when I was a teenager. So Diva by Mac, which is this very burgundy red. And I fell in love with that. I still wear that color. Um, and it was just this kind of entryway into a different form of being and it's just mm -hmm. so interesting like a little object like that um just a little change in self can kind of like open you up to a whole new way of being treated and being seen and then you can kind of move in a different way mm -hmm. um, you know I remember my Puerto Rican grandfather hated it he hated the red lip and he'd be <laughs> one of me um, but I was like sorry this is who I am yeah, my mom, I remember the first time, because before, I don't think I had the confidence to wear the red lipstick. Yeah. I think the red lipstick was wearing me. And I, I just went through like a shift. And my mom was like, oh, red is for putas. I'm like, yeah, what? Exactly. What? I was, and my mom doesn't speak like that. So when she said that, I was like, whoa, let's not go there. But honestly, it kind of made me rebel a little bit more. And I wore it even more proudly. But it's true that like, people do treat you differently based on what color you wear. And I just think that's crazy. Well, and I think the attitude you even have, right? You know, because sometimes when I'm going out, I'll be like, oh, is it a nude lip night or a red lip night? Um, yes. I remember last week with my friends, and I'm like, oh, it's a nude lip night. But last night I went out dancing and I was like, oh, it is a red lip night. And yes. you know, I was doing the layers with the lip, you know, like you learn all the tricks, the lip liner, then the powder and the blotting, and then you put it back on so it doesn't wear off. And then, you know, last night at midnight, I'm like scrubbing my Clubbing. lips to get it off, you know, just like, exfoliating exactly so um and then I take the red lip off and I'm I'm mm -hmm. a chill person again that's awesome so I it's interesting because I did read that you were once a witness yeah. and I had a best friend growing up who is still a witness and kind of wow. brought me into it and I I even went and got baptized at like oh. 21 girl oh. yes out <laughs> Um, and it's cause I grew up in a Catholic household and it was so hard to like, leave it. I really thought I was like going to die and I was wow. gonna, you know, um, and like the hardest part was losing the connections because right. there were still friends and people that I loved and you're shunned. Um, you're shunned and you're shunned. Yeah. No one can talk to you. And it was so hard. So growing up for you was writing an outlet or how did you get into writing? I have always been a storyteller. Um, I come from a lineage of just amazing storytellers. Uh, my mom, my tias, my grandmothers, like incredible storytellers. And before I could write, I would literally record stories into a little Fisher Price tape recorder. Um, and then I've been writing my entire life. I don't remember a time that I wasn't writing. And um, because I was so isolated growing up within the Jehovah's Witness community, I didn't really have a lot of friends. I didn't have a lot of connections. So I would turn to story. I would turn to library books and things like that. I would just read all the time to kind of escape um, the kind of cruel world that though I was taught that the world was really cruel by Jehovah's Witnesses. So I was like, oh, I need to escape. So books were how I um, kind of was able to, to live my own life. And writing just always came very naturally to me. And it always mm -hmm. has. And um, here I am, you know, how many decades later still doing it. So 
That's incredible. Good for you. Yeah. The, the, the truth, right. Is very isolating. And I remember like them being really anti going to college and oh, wow. me having to grapple with that. Um, but I eventually, you know, walked away. Um, how was that for you? Or did you make a conscious decision? Did you ever get baptized or? Well, we left when I was very young. We left when I was about 12 years old. Okay. Um, my mom had grown up in the religion in Brooklyn and then met my father who was um, studying there at Bethel and he they got they were married they got married right before the world was supposed to end in 1976 and so they came to California and my mom raised me and my sisters in the religion my dad was an elder um, but I think my mom was really scared for us because she saw how young women were so abused in the church mm -hmm. and she was really protective of us and she saw especially because my father was an elder I think she had an insight to what would happen to girls who stepped out of line at all and my sisters and I were all very kind of independent free spirits and she also knew they forced people to get married very young not go to college and live a life of fear and she didn't want that for us so um, she made a very hard decision to leave the religion when I was about 12, which was very jarring uh, to go from like the world is going to end any day now. Don't believe in the future. You can't Waiting for Armageddon. To, like do what you want. <laughs> and I was like, wait, what? And then I think a lot of, I worked out a lot of kind of that pain through Indir, the character, when you mm. lose your belief system, when you lose your identity, who are you? Who mm -hmm. are you? World. like you've been raised this entire way to believe that you are a certain type of person that you have this path in life but when that is taken from you like who do you become how do you how do you situate your life yeah I um okay. after because I started reading but then when I found out that you were once a witness I was like huh I made that connection too yeah. so were any other characters inspired by real people that you know or I mean out I think people become you know um I think the sisters are sometimes based on my sisters in some ways and I remember when they were reading the book they were trying to figure out which one of them oh, was sweet. you know like am I am I Delu am I Zeri um I, I I don't know I think there's um Bruta and Kinet are based on a couple of friends of mine um so but and then Saya's mom is um loosely based on a friend's mom growing up who is very cruel and manipulative oh I do not like her <laughs> oh we're, no, nobody likes her nobody likes her like this lady is so bogus like what and there's so many toxic moms in our community that we don't talk mm -hmm. about right who have so much who have a lineage of cruelty that they're a part of um, and that cruelty and some, it's, it's really screwed up and um, it still exists. You know, you still mm -hmm. see really cruel mothers who are very manipulative. So writing that character was hard because, uh, yeah, it was a hard character to write because she was so cruel. I'm like, that exists. And I wanted to show a character who could also kind of break away from that. Yeah. Um, you know, I think with Latinas, especially, are, feel like our mothers are very much into like what will people say oh, and what people God. think and ¿Qué va a decir la gente? And sometimes I'm like I don't care mom yes. I really don't but it's still hard because their opinion of me still matters so much and I had to go through a lot of uh, therapy to get over some of that because I always cared so much about what people thought and I'd reached a point where I was like this is not how I want to live um and I don't think that my mom would characterize it as necessarily cruel, but it is so like stifling to who you are as a person and your ability to just live in, authentic, in authentic ways. Um, so yeah, that's kudos to you for even going there. Cause I don't think that a lot of people would be bold enough. Um, how was your process for like writing the book? Was it hard? I know a little bit ago you said, you know, there's a difference between being a writer and an author. What was that process like? Yeah, I wrote the book over so many years. Um, I started the book in 2011. Um, I wrote the first couple of chapters, then abandoned it. And it was a book that I would go back and forth through um, for years. And then when I signed with my agent in 2017, 
he signed me based on a bunch of short stories that I had written. He really liked my short fiction. And he asked me, he goes, do you have any longer projects? So I was like, oh, I have this book that I have probably like halfway written. Uh, I can send it to you and see what you think. And he was like, you need to finish this book. <laughs> I was like, okay. Bet. Um, so I finished the book. The book that I sold is not the book that you read. Um, oh. And I sold it right after I turned 40 in 2019. And then through the editorial process, the book was originally only in Deer's book and the editor and Saya's book was a completely different book. And so the editor said, hey, I want you to take both these books, cut them in half and weave them together. Can you do it like in six months? And I was like, absolutely. And, but it was during pandemic. So I had to completely rewrite The Lost Dreamer, not from scratch, but from pretty bare bones during pandemic, during this very intense, isolated, period in life full of fear and not any human touch or social you know being social so um when I reread the book I was like oh my deep loneliness from pandemic is in the my loneliness my fear all of these things made it into the text um and I read it wow. and I, of course, I think every author when you read your book you read a completely different book than the reader does because you know all the emotional architecture and work and history that goes into it. So I love when people connect to the book, but I'm like, I don't know. Like I read a completely different book than anybody else. Interesting. Now, did you feel like emotionally, I don't know, were you happy with the finished product? Because I feel like if you intended to write a completely different book, I know that the editing process is a beast. Um, did you have any emotional like, no, I want to keep this part in? Or were you kind of just excited to be writing the book? You know, there were parts where I, 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 I one of the things I did that I really love, um, I kept a video diary the entire time that I was rewriting. I kept a video diary during pandemic because I couldn't journal for some reason. And there's a couple, I haven't looked at any of them. I have over 400 daily video diaries I've made during, pandemic, during editing. And there was, I only, I've only watched a few, but one of them I really loved um, that I found where I talk about the grief process of having to cut things in a book and not having just to grieve the character or grieve the scene or grieve, you know, what's happening, but grieving the person I was when I wrote that. You know, mm -hmm. there were some really beautiful scenes that and characters that are completely gone. And I had to grieve because like, oh, I really like I remember when I wrote that that version of Liz doesn't exist anymore. And but she had to be a part of this journey. Um, and I was happy with the book. I wasn't expecting it to, um, you know, you go in with different expectations. But my my mantra, my meditation is to trust the story, you know, to trust the story mm -hmm. that I'm supposed to write will come through me. That, you know, it's been such a series of miracles to get to this point in my life where I'm an author that I'm like, oh, I have to trust the process because I defy all odds to be a published author, you know, and with an amazing press with FSG, you know, um, I'm a construction worker during the day and I'm an author when I get home. That's a miracle. Like that is very, I mean, I don't know if anybody else does that. Yeah. What a badass. <laughs> um <laughs> You know, as I was reading it too, I had no idea that you had intended it to be two different books. Um, one of the things, again, that I'm so like amazed by is like, there are so many characters and places and, and names that are just not in our everyday vernacular, right? No. How do you keep it straight? Do you like map them out? I, I've I have, just been I've so... Been bulletin board so I went online and I printed out pictures of what I thought the characters would look like and then I printed them out and I had them on a bulletin board with little names over them and so I could kind of look at them and visualize them and then the cast like these are the people in the city of Alcanza these are the people in Saya's world um, and then I printed out some really trippy pictures of how I imagined the dream would look um, and so those were there on my bulletin board. Um, and I eventually got rid of my desk and my um, bulletin board because I would just sit there and stare and not write. So now I write in front of a window where I'm facing, um, I have a little bird bath, a little balcony where I have hummingbirds and all sorts of birds come through. So now I face nature when I write. Yeah, because it's just you, 
there's so many and I, I it's a whole like, telenovela cast basically yeah. you know <laughs> when I reread it I'm like oh you wrote a telenovela in a fantasy world <laughs> okay so that was going to be my next question were you always into fantasy did you always want to write in the genre or how did you land on it you know I loved fantasy growing up but I didn't think I could write it because there was you know it's it's so interesting about visibility and children and the things we see. If you don't see something exist, you don't really think it's possible, right? Mm -hmm. So I, even as a child and as an adolescent, when I was writing, I didn't know we were allowed to write about ourselves or our lives. And um, when I started writing short fiction, I would write kind of these, I call it like bruja lit, like these kind of otherworldly stories. And, um, in 2006, I was in a novel writing class for another book that I have that I love that one day we'll see the world, uh, mm -hmm. hopefully make it into the world. And there was this author in the class, um, Cindy Pond, and she was writing this beautiful kind of Chinese based fantasy. And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. If she can do that, I can do that. And I have this very intense dream world. And so I already had, you know, kind of this idea of this place that I would see in my dreams and I was like I'll write about my dream world and see what happens and but it was just that just seeing this other woman and she's now published several books and we're friends she lives in San Diego um but it's just that sometimes you need somebody else to give you permission and you don't even know you yeah. need permission which is really sad I was in my 30s before I even considered that it was a possibility because mm -hmm. it wasn't being published you didn't see it on the shelves and then now I'm like, oh my gosh, we need this. We need this for, our, we need this not just for the kids, but for the adults. Yes. Um, so I'm an educator, right? And so uh, my co-host is as well. And when we were talking about the book, that was one of the things I said is that it, it's that visibility. And when I read in the back that it was a fantasy, I was like, oh my God, I don't think I've ever picked up a book that I could connect with, but still have it be under that genre. Usually it's, you know, just like the typical, they're good books, but never a fantasy. Um, and so that was really exciting. And we talked about like, how can we get it in young people's hands? Because I think there's a real like thirst for it. Um, and so just getting nerds who don't yeah. want to escape. Like we oh, totally. I mean, we love contemporary literature. I love, I love where, but we're contemporary world building and these characters are very present, but sometimes you just want to go somewhere far away in another universe, in another dimension, in another kind of realm. Um, mm -hmm. and as an author, it creates so many creative possibilities. Yeah. So where has the book taken you? Like, has, have you, you know, are you doing these speaking engagements or yeah. Can you I talk a little a bit about that? I did a ton of travel after the book came out. I was on, I don't think, I think there was a period between March and August where I was never home more than two or three weeks at a time. I don't even remember. It was a blur. It was such a, it was at a very intense year, the year the book came out. So, um, I remember going to Texas a lot. I went to the East Coast. I I went a lot of places. I did a yeah, couple cool. of festivals and conferences and young adult kind of literary festivals. Um, and it was a blur, but it was beautiful. I was just like, oh my gosh, this is a dream. Mm -hmm. This is this is a dream. And then by the end of it, I was like, if I never eat Marriott scrambled eggs again, I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I read that you, this is a duology you plan on writing. Yeah. The second book is almost done. It's called the twin serpents and it's, okay. you know, without giving anything away, it's Saya and Indir's journey together. And, um, the very, the book is basically about their relationship and, um, all the wounds they're each bringing to their connection and how to kind of navigate this dynamic of um trying to love somebody you don't know yeah oh my gosh without giving, without giving away the ending of the lost dreamer you know it's going to be <laughs> it's a very intense because of their individual history yes. they're gonna have some they're, they're having some very intense challenges I mean it's oh such a gosh. hard right that I've actually um <laughs> I've, it's been such a hard book to write that my therapist and I have had therapy sessions for the characters. 
where I'm pretending that I'm one of the characters. I'm like, this is what I'm feeling. This is this is what's coming up, you know? Yeah. And because it's such an emotionally wrenching book to write. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like it. It's um. Do you have any like idea of when it would come out? It's coming out in 2024. Yeah. Oh, so it'll be out next year. Yeah, I um, I was late on my deadline this last year. It has been hard. I, after the lost or no, like right before the lost dreamer came out, my dad was diagnosed with ALS. Oh, and had, I'm sorry and to hear that. Oh, thank you. But you know that just takes up so much emotional space to be in that place of navigating, navigating. very deep change. Mm-hmm. Hola, ¿te gusta nuestro contenido? then go ahead and hit that like button and subscribe. So. Uh, has, did writing help you go through that or it gave you a block, you think? I think I was a little bit blocked, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, you have to prioritize where your like emotional safety is at times as a writer. And so I was like, okay, my priority right now is um, time with this transition within myself and within my family and that's okay and luckily my editorial team is very understanding um and but now you know being so deep in the book I'm like oh all of that is making its way into the work yeah uh you know I was as I've been reading it um do you think like you would want to see it like a series or a movie out of it (laughs) Yes, it would be I mean, so beautiful. Cast alone, just casting it. Imagine all those beautiful, beautiful brown skin brown. bodies on temples in jungles, you know, not fighting for their survival, not fighting a colonizer, you know, seeing these beautiful landscapes and these temples, because there's so much idea in this, you know, there's all these ideas in the world that this world, you know, the half the planet was kind of just like this empty place before Mm -hmm. um, colonization. And I think recently, just within the last couple of weeks, they've discovered in Yucatan, something like is it 60? No, or maybe more, maybe 60, maybe 600. I don't remember miles of city underneath of Mayan architecture. And so there's this beautiful world that hasn't been explored in Mm -hmm. fantasy. And look at how everybody went wild for the no cuerta in um, the Black Panther movie. Imagine a cast full of people. Yes. So beautiful. It would be. Like I've said, we've ignored stories of half the planet in service mm-hmm. of stories for the other half, at mm-hmm. least in fantasy. So I, I would love this. Because I, I was thinking, what, yes, when I was reading it, I was like, this would be a really great series or a movie. Again, for the same reasons, it would be so beautiful. Um, and, you know, indigenous populations on this side of the world were such great astronomers and mathematicians and And the trade trade across this the entire body of land I mean it's just incredible such an untapped you know group of people that you know could be represented and I'll be honest even in Wakanda forever I feel like they could have done a little bit more oh it was nice it was pretty but it wasn't I think it could have just I was a little let down. <laughs> so. Well, there's so much lushness that isn't explored or it's explored through a very specific lens. You think of like, people are like, yo, like apocalypto. I'm like, mm, no, 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 no. 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 Uh, maybe the cast, cause they're absolutely beautiful. But I still mm. think that was very much through like this very Western lens of what this world was. And then the world that I have is very much a matriarchy, um, which also existed that you don't see. And I think it would be beautiful. And I would love to just plant those seeds of curiosity in the children, because right now um, the Latina population, 18 and under is 25% of the entire population for people in this country who are under the age of 18 and 2% of the books are written for us. Yes, yes. Yeah, I um, I actually knew that because my co-host and I are writing and somehow in the conversation that statistic came up. And again, all the more reason why we wanted to have you on the podcast because I'm like, she's out here really doing this and in a genre that does not, I feel like if you look at the genre then it's even less perhaps. Oh, yeah. 
And um, a couple of us, there's, um, you know, Aiden Thomas, the Sunbearer Trials is within this world, but that's more of a futurism, right? His, mm -hmm. It's more of um, a futuristic world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's just, there's very few of us. Yeah, very few. And, and that lens that you spoke of, um, I was listening to a podcast on how, um, when we talk about this world, the people are depicted as extremely savage, extremely violent. And if anything, the colonizers were the savages, they were violent, right? So like we, but even when they are- That serves the narrative, right? Of being able yeah. to oppress people, right? That yeah. serves, you know, saying that our ancestors were these very violent people, these very savage people, these very, these people who didn't know what they were doing, that justifies the violence that still continues to happen on indigenous land and societies that you see right now happening in the rainforest right now you know in south america that even just immigration it allows to villainize people who are walking along these natural trade routes that have existed for centuries centuries you know, that the border mm -hmm broke up entire trade routes and cultures and communities that had been interacting for generations upon generations. Mm -hmm. Even here in San Diego, the border broke up Kumeyaay land, where um, around Kumeyaay land. And when the border went in, it broke up, it broke up, you know, their territory, their land. Mm -hmm. And there's Kumeyaay on the south of the border, Kumeyaay in the north, and they weren't able to interact for a couple of generations, I think, until the 90s. Wow. Yeah. And see, and even, you know, as educators, I often talk about how we're not equipped to even teach that history. Like it's not even discussed. Okay. Um, I do know, and I wasn't anticipating taking it here, but I do know that you're into the Mexican American studies in Arizona, right? Oh yeah, God, that was like 10 years ago. Was that 10 years ago? Oh, that whole disaster. And you see it happening now in Florida with yes. you know, um, banning of the books. Study. Well, the thing is, if you take people's education away, if you take... It serves empire, essentially. It's it ser it serves oppression. It is it mm -hmm. serves people. If you don't know the history, you can't change it, right? Mm -hmm. it's yeah. Sad. And I'm like, it's so sad. American, American history, way. I'm like, that was Mexico up until 1848, right? Half the United States was a territory of Mexico up until 1848. And taking that out of the history books is such a disservice. And before that, and still is indigenous land. And saying that doesn't, like erasure is such a violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And our teachers are not equipped. No. We are, again, we continue to see how diverse our classrooms are becoming, yeah. yet very little of the curriculum reflects our students. Yeah. And everything centers around white people um and it's tragic so a lot of this the little that i do know i had to teach myself because no one i was never exposed to this again this is why reading your work is so exciting because it's like man i would have loved this as a kid i think i would have been different you know a different type of writer than you know what i am today yeah thank you i hope i hope i'm planting seeds of curiosity i hope i'm planting seeds of um of change, right? Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I was, when I was in my twenties, I, I was, I have really severe ADHD. I wasn't diagnosed until a few years ago. And <laughs> so I dropped out of college because I couldn't handle it. It just wasn't for me. I'm a really, I'm really good at self-learning and self-motivated, but you put me in a classroom, my brain just kind of sh shuts off. And so in my twenties, um, I decided to travel in Mexico on my own with a backpack, like a white girl. My whole family, oh, wow. <laughs> family was like, what are you doing? You don't do this. Like our people don't put backpacks on and just go wandering countries. And I'm like, well, they do now. Yeah. And I traveled all over Mexico by myself with my big old travel backpack and um, staying in hostels and probably not safe, but hitchhiking and doing all these like wild child things that I saw the white girls doing. And I was like, I can do that. <laughs> And um, I, it was really an awakening for me to go to all these um, these sites like Palenque and Chiapas and Uxmal and Yucatan and Teotihuacan, all these places. And just to sit there and be like, oh, 
oh, oh, this is where we're from. This is mm-hmm. incredible. I I want I want this world to be seen. Um, and so hopefully I did that. Yeah, you did. What was your favorite? Oh, I love Palenque in Chiapas. Um, I think yeah. that's one of my favorites, favorite places, just because it is um, surrounded by jungle. So the city of Alcanza is loosely based on Palenque, but it would just be a co- like a coastal jungle. Um, and I loved Palenque. Palenque just has a power to it. That's incredible. Yeah. I love Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan. I was there last year. Um, and yeah, I haven't been in a minute, but yeah, I remember just sitting on the steps, I think at the building they call the cathedral in Palenque and just hearing the, the how, what are they called? The howler monkeys roar in the forest. They sound like jaguars. Oh, wow. And just being above the tree line and see, I was just like, oh, oh, there's so much power here. And then even when I go to where my family's from in Mexico, uh, my family's from Sinaloa. And it's just so funny to me. Because I'll go to like my uncle's house and there'll be just like all these stone beads and gods and goddesses just like sitting on the table. And I'll be like, what's that? They're like, oh, we found those in the fields. And they're like pre-Columbian, pre-contact artifacts that are like wow 1500 years old it's like yeah we were digging in the mangoes and look at this little doll how funny and I'm like uh you should probably give this to a museum um but it's just yeah it's still very much present and so I'm like oh cool yeah my family's from Michoacan um love Michoacan yeah it's I think it's a pretty dope place you know the yeah. monarchs and there's you get everything I think uh, that Mexico has to offer but I do want to go to Oaxaca I know I have some friends there and they always rave uh, about it and how Oaxaca beautiful is so it is beautiful yeah because I think that's what I think of when I think of like Mexican art is just that region and the vibrant colors and the people are just so nice and beautiful I love it I remember being in Oaxaca and just one of my feet, I'm pretty tall. And I remember I was walking through a market, a Zapotec market, and this woman stopped me and she was like, Oh my gosh, you you look so Zapotec. You're so tall, you're never gonna find a husband. And I was like, Cool, I don't want one, but thank you. Yeah. Um, it was just like this level of honesty that I really appreciated. Um, and yeah, Oaxaca is absolutely stunning. The food is amazing. The people are incredible. Uh, it's hard because I want to travel Mexico a lot again. Um, but it's harder as you get older. You have more responsibilities and commitments. Yes. I'm really yes. glad that I was able to kind of take that time and space in my 20s mm-hmm. and do that. Good for you. Um, you you talk about some of the seeds that you wanted to plant with the book. I think another one that you're missing is just the sense of pride. Like, I felt just so proud reading this. Like, damn, this this author really, I think, did this world justice and I could connect with it. And that's a lot of the stuff that we're missing, too, is I think a lot of young people are reaching for something that they could be like, you know what, this is ours. And this is something that I'm really proud of. Um, And I tried to write it with love for us. Yeah. Like deep love for us. And Mm -hmm. I want, I want the readers, especially those of us where this is our lineage to have that love awakened to be like, you come from, we come from incredible lineages of power and possibility, astronomy, art, agriculture. If you do the history, you'll realize that to this day, people cannot replicate those building techniques. To this day, the astronomy from thousands of years ago is still accurate. That is our lineage. And the reason, and, and it's, been temporarily broken by colonization but I'm hoping that there is a reawakening for this love and this power and this um curiosity for wisdom Mm -hmm. and you've definitely done that girl I'm serious like you've instilled that is there anything else that you hope the readers walk away with from the book or themes maybe I mean I hope they just want more right I hope they want more and you know that to trust the story that you're living even when it's hard um, because you see both these characters going through some really 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 hard things and you don't know why to the very end of the book when there's the reveal and you're like oh they were both living these really hard stories so they could find each other Mm -hmm. um, and have this new story 
uh, yeah, that, try, and you know, you can build the family you want, um, yes. build the family you want, you know, like that's what Saya has to do. Um, and sometimes you have to like India kind of walk away from your family to become who you are. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Um, a side note, I also have really bad ADHD. <laughs> I feel like we're parents. I think it's a superpower. I think it's a superpower, right? I think that yeah. AD, you know, I think the reason ADHD is so vilified or, you know, kind of frowned down upon in this world is because we live in a capitalist society where productivity and is how you are judged. Like you're only as good as what you can create. You're only as good as what you can do. We're ADHD people. We have these beautiful minds that can hop all over the place and see things from different angles and kind of just be these little weirdos in the corner. And society doesn't want weirdos in the corner. It mm -hmm. wants people to sit down, do the job, do the work. And comply. They comply. And um, um, so I love that ADHD. I feel like ADHD is a superpower. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. it allows me to be kind of liberated from this system once I, you know, made peace with that. Yeah, it, it has helped me in tremendous ways too. I think my creativity stems a lot from that. And and like you said, my ability to look at things from different perspectives um, has really served me well, I think. So yeah, it was just when you said that, I was like, damn, me too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I, I know. It's, I, it's, it's challenging, you know, it definitely has its challenges and I've been on and off medication for it. And um, at the end of the day, though, I think it's a gift. I'm like, okay, having a, um, what they call like a neurodiverse brain. I'm like, no, this is just a creative brain. This mm -hmm. is not all, unfortunately we live in a world and a society that wants us all to go along the specific path in the system and that doesn't work, right? You know, and within this, these worlds I built, hopefully you see that people are allowed to live and thrive according to their strengths that are inherent mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. And and again, like make, choosing your own family as well, especially when you come from a background that um, is so rich and you feel all these pulls to it, but you sometimes just have to step away. And that's oh, yeah. hard. I established myself as a black sheep of the family very young. And so now the whole family, like they've stopped worrying about me and they're like, oh, that's just Liz. Liz yeah. is good for what she does. And I'm like, thank you. How do they feel about, about your book? They were all really, I mean, I think because I have ADHD and because um, I was kind of a late bloomer, everybody's like, oh yeah, she's writing a book. It's cute. Oh, we love what you write. You're so sweet. And then when I sold the book and when the book came out, everybody was like, she did it. This is amazing. And they were really happy and really excited for me. I mean, my, my, my immediate family, my parents and my sisters were very much like, oh, we know you'll do this. Like you're on your own timeline, but you'll do this. Um, my extended family, probably a little bit more cheese made inside eye, but whatever, I'm used to that. Um, and they're really excited. You know, I'll get pictures from like at the at an airport. She's like, I saw your book at the airport. Oh, that's so um, sweet. And, you know, they're, they were very excited for me and happy for me. Um, a few of them even read it. <laughs> sweet. So, uh, but it's been good. I mean, the part that I have a lot of family who doesn't speak English. Mm -hmm. um, in Mexico and Puerto Rico, and they really, really want the book in Spanish. I'm like, I have no control over that. I don't, mm -hmm. the rights have to be sold, but I would mm -hmm. love the book to be in Spanish one day. It would, I, I was just going to say, oh, I hope it can get done because I mean, I think it would just expand it that much more. Think of all the Spanish speaking countries that it could I go mean, into. I mean, the planet essentially, yeah. like this whole half of the planet, you know, uh, a real. lot of speakers and yeah, I, I would love that and to do a show. I mean, there's so many possibilities. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. And yes, I, again, I want to thank you so much for writing thank this. For yeah. Thank you for having me, for being excited about the book. It means yes. so much. Writing, writing is so isolating. You spend so much time by yourself in your pajamas, just staring at a screen being like, is this worth it? And then when you connect, you're like, oh, this is, this is worth and it. And I hope, 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 hope that you get to make it into a show or a um, movie. Me too. Let's put that. It's going to happen. I'm just going to put it there. Put that energy out there. I mean, imagine that just the cast alone would be so beautiful and the temples and the pure and the scenery, and the environment the and the Jaguar women. And look at, I mean, I imagine, you know, something with the scale of like Game of Thrones, but within a fantastical indigenous world, the possibilities are just, yeah. well, yes. Stuff.
I, it's going to happen. Keep I'm pushing happy. for it um, because it's a beautiful book and Thank you're you. a very talented writer. So. I, I remember being through like the first couple chapters and I looked at my husband like, damn, she's good. Thank you. It's I was like, she brain. Yes, yes. And and like you, I I didn't know until I was much older. I think also being a girl, yeah. my my ADHD was more here. I wasn't necessarily yeah. bouncing off the wall. I, I mean, because it shows up differently. Well, it shows up differently in women than it does in men. And the thing is as well, like all the research was done on like young white men and mm -hmm. it presented differently in women. And I think specifically within cultures like ours, mental health is not seen as something that's real or that mm -hmm. uh, really exists. So it's been a navigation to like be tell my parents be like I have ADHD I am on the spectrum these are the things my brain works differently than other brains and that's okay okay yeah we're pathologize it we're not going to make it a bad thing you know it's not like we get mad at dad for having diabetes like that's just how his body works that's mm. okay. you know we're we're not angry at so and so for this part you know yeah, so I think within our communities, there's still a lot of work to be done toward um, mental, mental health. health. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, it's our tradition on the podcast um, to kind of end with a final thought. Okay. If you want the listeners to walk away with one thing, um, what would it be? And again, thank you because bomb. Those of you who haven't had a chance to pick it up, the Lost Dreamer, Liz Huerta, um, fantastic book. Anything you want to say? <laughs> um, that our stories don't end. They just change shape. And that we're all part of bigger stories than we can ever imagine. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you so much, Lynn. <laughs> this was so good. Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much. Keep representing. You're doing a hell of a job. And we need, we need your work. So take care of it. <laughs> Keep jumping on that trampoline, girl. <laughs> All right. Hopefully we'll um, be in touch and I can't wait to read more books. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you liked this episode and would like to see more, check out these videos.